So the Russia hoax is a source of a lot of the political polarization that's been happening, the left versus the right. So what's interesting personally to me is I take this stuff for granted because I've been following this pretty closely since it all happened. But when I talk to other people, it's overwhelming. overwhelmingly most people have no idea what happened or the people that are involved or even what's going on now. Because there's still a uh, Durham investigation going on, a special prosecutor. So Estefania is going to go through and tell us what the facts are. Thank you, Corey. 2016 was a year that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump faced each other for the presidential elections. During the time of running, the Russia hoax was started to get a little bit popularity. And the Russia hoax, well, it was developed by the deep state, quote, deep state and the media, an attempt by the fifth column within the FBI to engage in a coup, a conspiracy, a framed job, nothing less than the attempt overthrow of the U.S. government. Therefore, the Russia hoax was created to overthrow Donald Trump. And going back to hoax, which is defined by someone trying to make people believe something that is not true, is what the left party tried to do and sent out the message to the media about Trump. Which we get into the Steele dossier. Does anyone know a bit about the Steele dossier, Jocelyn? Or Trump? No, this is my first time ever hearing that word. Yeah. So what's it about? So basically claimed Russian officials held compromising information on former President Donald Trump. It was political research containing allegations, conspiracy, and cooperation between Trump and Russia. Yeah, stuff like Trump was hooking up with prostitutes in Russia and they were like peeing on him or just stuff like that. And I had heard also that um, there were actually people connected to Russian intelligence that were talking to this Christopher Steele guy who put this thing together mm -hmm. and he looks like a gullible idiot and it wouldn't surprise me one bit if those guys are hanging out and they're going passing all this stuff on this guy's going wow we're getting some great dirt on donald trump and then he goes and passes it off to you know which obviously we'll hear the the food chain of where all the stuff ended up mm -hmm. and christopher christopher Steele was a former british spy which is interesting was that MI5? Is it? So he was a literal James Bond, but kind of like a communist James Bond. He's one of those guys that kind of, you could tell he believes the government should run everything, run and regulate every aspect of people's lives. So to him, this is totally cool because of who he did it for. Christopher Steele wrote a report for the private investigative firm Fusion GPS paid by Hillary Clinton campaign and a Democratic National Committee. Therefore, piggyback what you were saying. Huh. Imagine that. So the Hilda Beast was the one behind all this bullshit. It was just, you know, election mudslinging. Continuing, the FBI relied on the dossier to obtain four Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act FISA warrants against former Trump campaign aide. Carter Page, the so FBI. That, the, the FISA court is basically what was created after September 11th to say, hey, we've got outside communications communicating with people in the United States that we think are basically terrorists. So it allows them to listen to the incoming and outgoing communications and spy on whoever is talking in the United States. Because the idea is you're going to, you're going to, um, identify a potential terrorist before they do something or cause an attack. And so now they're going to the FISA court saying, hey, we've got the, I was it Carter Page? Was that the guy? Carter Page. That was working for Trump's campaign. And I think his wife is Russian. And so there's speculation that she could be a Russian agent or, I mean, she's very beautiful. But I think she's an American citizen now. And so they unmasked him, if I'm not mistaken. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And they used that as justification to start the FISA warrant. And then they started opening more with different people in the Trump administration. 
And then there were details ending up in the New York Times, stuff that came from the Steele dossier. And I, apparently in the FISA warrants, the news that appeared in the New York Times and other um, media outlets was used as justification for these FISA warrants because they're like, hey, we've got this stuff that's supposedly going on. It's in the New York Times. We really should look into it. And so the the judge, and I think Comey, Director Comey, signed off in a, in a, on the application for the FISA stuff. Is that Am I accurate in that? So he did. And continuing from what I was saying, the FBI was also investigating allegations in the dossier that the Kremlin was blackmailing Donald Trump and that the campaign was involved in a, quote, well-developed conspiracy of cooperation, end quote, with Russia to influence the election. So Russia was basically helping Trump getting get elected. That was the allegation. That's the allegation. Now, um, they weren't sure if Trump was colluding with Russia. I think they, they ended up spending, after all was said and done, something like seventy, eighty thousand dollars on Facebook on ads that just kind of sow division in people before they got found out, and Facebook cut them off. Probably. I, I remember know. reading about that. I don't remember what the amount was, but it wasn't a lot. Are you aware of how the sealed dossier came to life? Was revealed. So I remember it was. Christopher Steele was the guy that put it together. He's a former, was it MI5, MI6? What is the British intelligence? MI5, MI6? MI6. MI6, he put it together. So you have an idea of what it was, but going back on was how it was revealed. that's for sure. <laughs> so it was revealed, well, in, back in September, a private meeting was arranged between Steele and reporters from media outlets such as the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker, ABC News, and none of the media outlets published any stories before the election. So we have the Steele dossier, dossier talked about with the media, but the media chose not to upload it at yeah, all. Yeah, because a lot, a lot of the stuff that was in there, like, this is kind of over the top. They didn't have absurd. sources to rely on. I mean, on. it's comical how ridiculous the stuff that there's no way. I do remember some point in the last year or two that I can't remember what it was. There was... I read it. It was in an article or a video or something like that where they were talking about that there were, I mean, it was two Russians that were connected to Russian intelligence that also were meeting with Christopher Steele. And so if they got direct ties to the Kremlin and you know this thing's being put together for the Clinton campaign, I mean, why... Why wouldn't you put some bullshit in there just to fuck with the Americans? I mean, why not? So I be, the the like I said, it was an article or whatever. The reporting was that there were two Russian guys that were connected to Russian intelligence services, and Steele was meeting with them. And to me, that just seems like such a what a great way to fuck with your adversary and their elections. Other things that I heard, because as far as how the dossier came about, so Steele puts it together, and I know at some point John McCain, Senator John McCain, when he was still alive, he gets a copy of it. He doesn't like Trump. Remember, he ran for McCain ran for president, and he lost, and he did not like the idea that Donald Trump could possibly run and become president. He just hated that idea because he failed, and Trump succeeded. And you know, McCain made it obvious that he didn't like Trump and trolled him publicly, and Trump trolled him many, many times very publicly. And so he gave it to, I think it was the FBI and some other people. I don't know some other people in government or, but I know he did forward it to the FBI. He's like, hey, you guys should look into this and see what's what's on here. Because obviously you got to think on some level, he's hoping there's some of this stuff has got to be true and then there's, he can cause Trump to not get elected because hmm. he hated him. It's a lot of hatred in this world, especially towards Donald Trump. But with the news outlets, they were still into they were still looking into the story of the sealed dossier. It was circling around. Quotation Fusion and Steel tried to alert the US law enforcement and the news media to the material they've covered, uncovered. End of quote. And their office became 
quote, something of a public reading room, end quote, for journalists seeking information. So in, the journalists were seeking more information, trying to talk the topic, touch the topic, but they haven't published it until one news outlet thought it was right to do it. So by the third quarter of 2016, many news organizations yeah, Mother, knew about the existence. Mother of the Jones dossier. is there pretty far left on the news spectrum. Yes, they were the first ones to report on the existence of the dossier. And that is and that was exclusively funded by Democrats. A week before and the So that means that they paid Christopher Steele or Fusion GPS paid Christopher Steele to put this thing together. Because it was basically, yeah. well, what do they call it, political opposition research, trying to dig up dirt on your opponent so you can throw that stuff in the mm -hmm. media and people will go, oh my God, I can't believe this. I could never vote for that person. Because that's what they're, they're trying to do is influence the election through that stuff. Mm -hmm. And a week before the election, Mother Jones reported that a former intelligence officer whom they did not name had produced a report based on Russian sources and turned it over to the FBI. So it was later moved to the FBI. So here's some interesting history on Mother Jones. Not, not the, um, the news organization, but the person who the news organization was founded upon their principles or their views, if you will. And so she, they were, it was named for her. So she, so mother Jones from 19, 1897 onwards, she was an Irish born American school teacher and dressmaker who became a prominent union organizer, community organizer, i.e. Barack Obama was a community organizer and activist. She helped coordinate major strikes and co-founded the industrial workers of the world. So the interesting thing about her is she was a socialist. And I think it was, uh, what's his name? I think it was Lenin. He said the goal of socialism is communism. And there's a famous quote, I think it was by Nikita Khrushchev, who said that Americans will never accept communism. But if you give them small doses of socialism eventually it'll become a communist country and that's that's what they wanted so the bottom line is this she's a socialist communist marxist it, it's all all the same thing and so you have a basically a marxist a communist if you will and that's who this news organization mother jones was based upon her or named in her her namesake or whatever. Hmm. So anything that's left leaning or Marxist, they're going to jive with. And if it's a somebody on the left saying, "Hey, here I got the stuff," they're going to typically just believe it and run with it. So according to David Korn, which was published in October thirty first, two thousand sixteen. This article disclosed some of the dossier's allegations, and if you want, you can read it. It says, the first memo, based on the former intelligence officer's conversations with Russian sources, remember what I was just talking about, the Russians that were talking to Christopher mm -hmm. Steele, noted that the Russian regime has been cultivating, supporting, and assisting Trump for at least five years, and endorsed by Putin, has been to encourage splits and divisions in Western in the Western alliance. It maintained – so in other words, it's implying that Putin working with Trump is weakening NATO and the NATO allies, if you will, because that would – it'd be in Russia's interest if NATO was weaker and, and more divided. And if they could pull Trump away from NATO – I mean that's the implication here. So – to continue, it says it maintained that Trump and his inner circle have accepted a regular flow of intelligence from the Kremlin, including on his Democratic and other political rivals. It claimed that Russian intelligence had compromised Trump during his visits to Moscow and could blackmail him. It also reported that Russian intelligence had compiled a dossier on Hillary Clinton based on bug conversations she had on various visits to Russia and accepted, intercepted phone calls. And I guess this was David Korn was the one that had reported that. Yes. He's a, he's a well-known Democrat. 
He reported this on October 31st, 2016. Halloween day. And then it came to the Democrats' client stop paying for the investigation that was going on, but still wanted to continue on the dossier for Fusion GPS. So there was that issue after that. And according to the New York Times, after the election, Steele's dossier became one of Washington's, quote, worst kept secrets, end quote, and journalists worked to verify the allegations. You mentioned McCain before, and we're talking about him now. And in this bullet point, it says Republican Senator John McCain, who had been informed about the alleged links between the Kremlin and Trump, met with former British ambassador to Moscow, Sir Andrew Wood, at the Halifax International Security Forum in Canada. Wood told McCain about the existence of the collected materials about Trump and also vouched for Steele's professionalism and integrity. Then moving on to what the FBI thought, they relied on the dossier in its crossfire hurricane investigation to obtain four Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act FISA warrants against former Trump campaign and Carter Page that allowed them to listen in on his private communications. That's a not a violation of privacy if you have a warrant, but it's definitely difficult if someone's listening to your private conversations. Thanks, NSA. Yeah, they're always. Li- I assume <laughs> they're always listening. If you have a phone or a Siri in your device, or uh, even the Sonos speaker systems, and the new speakers have the little microphone. I mean, you literally have a spy device. If it's that device is hacked, I mean, you got microphones all throughout your house, basically. So I always assume they're on, and that it's being recorded. Because I mean, when you look at the Snowden stuff, it made it pretty obvious that all that stuff is recorded, all the conversations, and it sits there. And if they ever need to go and search, they have all that. That's very difficult. With the laptops, they can... And they don't even need a warrant. (laughs) They don't need a warrant? Well, I mean, they can pretty much do whatever they want. Who's to say they turned it on, looked, and and didn't? I mean, (laughs) it's it's just lines of code. Yeah. Here are some key facts on the information on the FISA warrants. So Deputy Attorney General Rob Rosenstein, FBI Director James Comey, Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe, and Acting Obama Holdover Attorney General Sally Yates all signed off on flawed applications for surveillance warrants throughout the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The FISA court, basically. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who are involved. So basically what that means is they all... Because uh, I think it was was Klein Smith was he the one? That, oh yeah, he was the one that falsified That's the email and pled guilty. So he basically falsified what was said in the email and then turned that into the FISA court, and that was used as justification to to, to grant that FISA warrant so they could unmask. I don't know which particular person they were unmasking because they had all the recordings of this stuff. So they have to go to the FISA court to get permission to. Reveal who it is and then look into that person's communications because it's like I guess they already have all the communications. It's just they're you know they're all sitting in a box, but they're they have to go to court to get permission to unmask that person and actually go through mm-hmm. what was discussed because these are private citizens of the United States. And so they basically go to the FISA court and they say, hey, we think this guy may be in cahoots with foreign intelligence. We got these news articles appearing in the New York Times and these other Mother Jones and these other places, and everybody's talking about it. So it's quite possible that this guy running for president might be a Manchurian candidate or he's being blackmailed by the Russians. And so this guy's turning in emails to the FISA court that basically make it look more legit mm-hmm. than in, than it actually was. And the judge looks at it and goes, Okay, well, it's granted. You can unmask and look into all those communications. And that that's basically what happened, and because uh, I guess it was the Horowitz investigation where – can you go, go back up a little bit? Um, was it Sally Yates and all them? They basically yes, right. were all sending out uh, – Signed off on flawed They all signed off on these flawed applications. 
So they just basically, they rubber stamped them. Sent, hey, got to be legit. Mm -hmm. Send it through. They all hated Trump, so, because they're all Democrats. Clive Smith claimed that Carter Page was never a CIA, CIA informant. Rather, he was purportedly an, purportedly. Am purportedly an American who unwittingly passed information to the CIA by communicating with an unidentified third person who was an actual CIA informant. Where it gets juicy. Yeah, well, we, we know Klein Smith, he's a felon. He's a convicted felon and a self-admitted felon. So you have to assume that any if he's willing to lie to like one of the highest courts in the land that it's the punishment is supposed to be for, severe for lying to it and he does it and gets away with it, why would he tell the truth about Carter Page? It's in his interest. At the end of the day, we, I mean, we know he eventually pled guilty to one felony count. Mm -hmm. He but, was charged, yeah. So we, we know he lied to the FISA court. That He's admitted he lied to the FISA court. So if he's willing to lie to the FISA court, then whatever he said about Carter Page, doesn't matter when he said it, it was probably a lie also. Because people don't change who they are. Leopard doesn't change his spots. Uh, especially a now convicted liar is always been that way so the thing about carter page why should i believe anything anything that comes out of klein smith mouth after he gets convicted for being a liar i'm gonna assume it's probably bullshit i'm not gonna believe anything that dude says there's nothing he says is credible he's got zero trust is the hardest thing to get and the easiest thing to lose so whether carter page is or isn't a cia informant klein smith is his opinion or what he says means nothing to me. He's fucking dirt as far as I'm concerned. Basically, once a liar, always a liar. Exactly. That's once a cheater, mean. always a cheater. <laughs> That's just his character. That's who he is as a human being. Mm -hmm. And he's been that way his whole life. He probably learned that in his family growing up. So the FBI also investigated the allegations in the dossier that the Kremlin was blackmailing Donald Trump and that the com campaign was involved in a well-developed conspiracy of cooperation with Russia to influence the election. So FBI was doing their own investigation also with these allegations of the dossier that went into the crossfire of hurricanes. Operation Crossfire Hurricane, as they call it. Operation, yes, sir. Now going to Comey, James Comey. What went down with James Comey? This is an FBI director who has been in the force for so many years, and he they say he broke protocol. So I remember that during the election because everybody – you had uh, – I think was it WikiLeaks pub published Hillary Clinton's emails. And so she had said things publicly that the emails I think contradicted – and so, I mean, there's pretty, some pretty salacious things that were in the emails that if it turned out those emails were all legit, then it makes Hillary Clinton look pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking because everybody's, you know, because, you know, the whole thing is lock her up. <laughs> we were chanting it at Trump's rallies and stuff like that during the election. And, and some of the things that Hillary had said about what wiping their disc, her disk drives clean mm -hmm. with like a cloth or whatever. In other words, because they had used uh, some kind of software to basically completely erase the data that had been on those disks and destroy it before anybody could, could look into it. So it, it just – she did things like that and smashing their phones with hammers that just made it look like they had something to hide and they were guilty. And so the FBI is looking into this and they publicly announce, yeah, we're, there's an, there is an active investigation into her emails or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And so the FBI's job, they're supposed to investigate, gather the evidence, turn it over to the Justice Department. And then the Justice Department says, yes, we're going to charge Hillary Clinton or no, we're not going to charge her. And so he comes out. I remember. I remember the because I saw the news comms. Everybody's, everybody's waiting. Like, what's going to happen? Is he gonna, they going to go out there or what? And then he just goes, "Oh, it's all good. She's good. You know, Hillary's. She's fine. We're not going to prosecute her." And he, that's not his job. He's not allowed to do that. He's the guy that he's the the bean counter. He's the the guy that collects the evidence and turns it over to mm -hmm. 
the attorney general. And the attorney general is the one that takes the evidence that the FBI puts together and other law enforcement agencies and presents it in a court of law. They take the shots. Exactly. And so he's not he doesn't have the authority to even say any of that stuff. And it's totally inappropriate for the FBI director to do that. Mm -hmm. And so as an American citizen, I look at that and go, that's kind of weird. Why is this guy coming out and basically saying, hey, she's totally innocent and it's all good? He doesn't have the authority to do that. So he I don't know what the legal consequences are of that, but it looks shady. So the other thing that happened around this time, this whole series of, of events, was that I think Bill Clinton was sitting in his private jet on the tarmac somewhere, and then uh, he invited Loretta Lynch to come and hang out. And so Loretta Lynch is the attorney general that is going to be the one taking the evidence from the FBI and potentially prosecuting his wife. And so... They hang out, and I don't know how long they were on the, the plane for. Do you know how long? Two hours? Two hours. They had a little chat for two hours. Long this chat. is the woman that potentially is going to prosecute his wife. This is the former president. And they're just hanging out. And afterward, because they thought it was just something that was discreet and nobody would have known about it, but I guess there were reporters or whatever. People saw that Loretta Lynch was hanging out with former president Bill Clinton, Hillary's husband for two hours on Bill Clinton's private jet and nobody knows what they talked about. And so when I remember when, when she was asked about, she's like, Oh, we talked about like, uh, we exchanged, you know, grandkids stories and we talked about yoga <laughs> just, you know, we're just catching up. No big deal. I potentially can put your wife in jail. But hey, we're just hanging out and, yeah. you know, just shooting the breeze. No, shoot the nothing shit, inappropriate yeah. happened. It's totally legit. And most people that saw that were like, and uh, then this whole thing with Comey comes out and says, hey, there's nothing here. And then they, Loretta Lynch, she doesn't really have to do anything at that point. So the implication, people, other people in the media and commentators were like, well, she, Bill Clinton, Hillary's husband's meeting with the person that's going to prosecute her. And the director of the FBI just basically says there's nothing here or eh, there's not enough evidence to really go after her. It's not a big deal. It, it's okay. No prosecutor would, would – serious prosecutor would prosecute Hillary because there's just really nothing here. And, um, and, and so Loretta can – you know, she's kind of off the hook because Comey does something that's not his job. And Comey's a Hillary booster. He's a Hillary supporter. He absolutely hated Trump and he made it pretty clear after the fact, after he was fired, who he had voted for and who he supported – and it's just these people are all chummy with one another. The attorney general, Comey, all all these people involved, they're all Democrats. And they all, I mean, it just looks like they're all, hey, it's part of the club. It's the, you know, it's the the elite. It's part of, it's the uh, good old boy network and you're not part of it. Democrats hating on Republicans? Yeah. I mean, it goes all the, both ways. Republicans hate Democrats, too. You know, they got their things. So all we can do is, as citizens is, because as Dwight D. Eisenhower said, politics should be the part-time profession of every American. Is I'm just trying to, you know, as a voter, I'm looking at this, and I'm supposed to, the media is supposed to do this investigation and tell us what actually happened so we can make an intelligent deform, and informed decision about who we're going to vote for. Mm -hmm. And so you see all this stuff, it's like, you don't know what was said in these conversations or what's going on behind closed doors, but it it just looks shady. It's inappropriate, yeah. Anyone who sees it or hears about it, they think it's us, especially the media reporters. Two hours in a jet, yeah, you can talk about a lot of things, stories, but... Well, most of the media was like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. We knew it all along. She's innocent. Hmm. Well, with Comey doing this informing the public before the elections on Hillary Clinton, he also did another inappropriate action where he briefed the president, Donald Trump, about the Steele dossier and that he was under investigation. So he wasn't supposed to do that. Oh, he told Trump that he was under investigation. Correct. And if you're invest the protocol says if you're investigating somebody, you don't tell them that they're under yeah, investigation. Yeah, you're not supposed you to say You just say that. we can neither confirm nor deny. 
I mean, what was Comey's intention for saying, oh, he's under investigation? What was it? Like, that's another question. So, bottom line is he's breaking protocols on both sides of the aisle. I mean, it's not new because he already did it with Hillary Clinton's emails. So, he's doing it again, which came out to be a well, little his, more. What's interesting about that is, like, when you're trying to analyze the character of Comey, the name of his book is called A Higher Loyalty. And so you could tell a higher loyalty. He's got a higher loyalty to what? To the country, to the Constitution. To me, that statement, a higher loyalty, is that he looks to what he's doing or his job, and he felt he was being a righteous guy in his behavior. In other words, mm -hmm. he may mm -hmm. almost like he's saying, I know I did things wrong, but I have a higher loyalty and it required me to kind of break protocol or, or do naughty things because it was the, in the best interest of the country based on his view. Hmm. That's what that title of his book says to me about him and his character and who he is and his model of the world, his identity, how he operates. Hmm. Well, Comey always wrote a memo and he did a memo between him and Donald Trump where an investigation was opened by the DOJ Inspector General Michael Horowitz. And in his final report, he rebuted Comey's claims that the memos were merely personal recollections, not official FBI records, and sharply criticized the former FBI chief for mishandling sensitive information, which was led to the Mueller investigation. So after this report, it went straight into the Mueller investigation. It's the media had to cover between the media covered Comey and Donald Trump and the memos and it slipped off and they had to go into another investigation, which was a bigger investigation that took um, a lot of time, energy and a lot of money, about close to thirty five million dollars. But it was like thirty two, I believe. So James Comey's actions were bad in the sense he broke protocol and former U.S. Deputy Attorney General Ro Rosenstein, he writes a letter to President Trump in regards to Comey. He says, the director was wrong to usurp the Attorney General's authority on July 5th, 2016 and announced his conclusion that the case should be closed without prosecution. It is not the function of the director to make such an announcement. At most, the director should have said the FBI had completed its investigation and presented its findings to federal prosecutors. This letter was sent out to Trump. So, I, so he's basically saying you should, he shouldn't have done that. I mean, he broke pro protocol, correct? It yeah, wasn't his duty to do that. It's not, he's not allowed to do that. He's, that's not his authority. So obviously you have the deputy attorney general trying to reach out to President Trump saying, hey, look, it's wrong. Something should be done. Did he recommend that Comey get fired in that letter? I thought that's what, what yes. part. Yeah. So he also, you're, so he did recommend to President Trump that because of, of what Comey did, the fact that he was, he was you he was using authority that he actually did not have he should be fired so it was rod rostein's rosenstein Rosen. rosenstein's Ro, rod rosenstein's determination or opinion that comey had made a fireable offense in other words he was when you're behaving this way you, you you're just not competent to be the fbi director so rod says you should fire his ass basically and so trump does he does. But when You're what fired. happens is... You're fired! <laughs> is. Yeah. Trump right. writes... What if he call, call him up? It's like, I just got to say it. You're fired! I wonder how it was. But what, yeah, supposedly it was for him to get fired. You're fired! <laughs> Loser! This is kind of kind of a funny part. Uh, when Comey was on a trip, and when Trump fired him... <laughs> So therefore, he's, I think he's giving a speech or something like that, and he he can't take his government plane back to – in other words, like it's stranded in the city he's at because he's no longer a government employee, so he can't take a government jet back to to Washington. So he's got to find his own way home. <laughs> take the taxi That's back. Epic. That's epic.
<laughs> well, Trump writes a letter to Comey. Seems like Trump knew what the main criticism of Comey's termination would be. The FBI was investigating the Trump campaign's, campaign's ties to Russia. So it sure seems convenient for Trump that he's managing to get rid of the director of that agency. In this letter, Trump is trying to not to not be so subtly to tell people the Russian investigation has nothing to do with the termination. And that's when days later, Comey writ wrote a memo which he... Yeah, because the public perception back then was they were expecting a thorough investigation. All of a sudden, Comey comes out and goes, oh, nothing here. And that people were like, what? So people did lose... That's one of those things that you just think, hey, it looks like it's the good old boys club and these people are just, you know, washing each other's ass basically and looking out for each other. And that's the kind of thing that the American people, because, you know, if you're on the left, you're like, Comey was great. And if you're on the right, you're going, that's horrible. So you're basically pissing off half the country. And that's not – the FBI is supposed to do its job and keep its fucking mouth shut. And Comey didn't do that. He was kind of an attention whore and taking upon himself authority that he didn't have. And that's one of those things that divided the country because you got at least everybody on the right is like, that's bullshit. And if he had just let the Justice Department do their job, that that would not have been a reason. The, the right would have never gotten pissed off about that. But when you just have like, you know, the death by a thousand paper cuts, that's just another paper cut. And when you have people losing faith in the government, that's not a good thing. Because if people get to the point where they have no faith in the government and they start ignoring the government, that's when you have anarchy and chaos. And at the end of the day, they are there are a small number of government people to keep order and peace. Like in one of our cities down here in South Florida, you got about 2 million people and 550 police officers for 2 million people. And you got 100 million plus gun owners. If shit really went south and people had no faith in the government, those 550 police officers ain't going to do nothing. And so you, it's not a good thing when the country gets divided and people lose faith in their government. And this kind of bullshit by people like Comey doing a – an incompetent job hurts the country. It harms the country. It harms the unity. It divides people instead of bringing them together. Because the one thing we're all supposed to share is liberty and justice for all. You know, the lady, you know, the justice scales, it's got the scale and there's a blindfold on. So based on the evidence versus, you know, guilty versus not guilty, it's just whatever the evidence is, you know, the facts are the facts. And you do something wrong, doesn't matter who you are, we're all supposed to be equal. The homeless guy in the street, as an American, is just as important as the president of the United States from a an individual human being perspective. Americans are the equals of their government. And when you see shit like this, it makes people go, our government is corrupt and incompetent, and I don't trust them. Yeah, it definitely is bad when the public loses trust in the government or the FBI. And then they think their own ways or they take matters in their own hands. So when you get half the country gets a perception that, mem like in this case, the m members of the FBI are basically looking out for their favorite candidate in such a public way that like millions of Americans can see and go, that doesn't look good. That's just not good for the country. Towards him apart. Well, once Comey was fired, they say he was angry, and that's when he wrote a memo. And in the memo, it stated that Trump had asked him to back off from the investigation of former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. The memo alleges that President said in a prior conversation with Comey at the White House, quote, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go, end quote. And so because of that memo, that's what set in motion the chain of events that caused Bob Mueller to be appointed as a special counsel to look in all this Russia stuff? Correct. So once 
obviously you have um, Comey and Trump having their business and uh, the getting fired. It was kind of suspicious for Rosenstein. And that's what the Mueller investigation was appointed. So the, because it does Rod, look suspicious. Rod says, hey, Mr. President, fire, you should fire Comey. What he did is a fireable offense. He fires Comey. Comey's like, hey, this is what Trump said to me in a private conversation. And then Rosenstein's like, Rosenstein's like, oh, I guess we need a special counsel in to investigate yeah. the president. Yeah, it was very suspicious for him. Because if you see the quote, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go. What is that supposed to mean? Like, oh, he's supposed to just like forget about it. Well, the That's the it. implication with that statement is that, hey, Flynn's a good guy. I hope you don't prosecute him. You just let him slide. Is that suspicious, yeah. though? Well, the argument can be made is if Flynn had done something wrong or inappropriate, he should be prosecuted for it. Because, again, just the scales of justice, justice is blind, as, as they say. And so if that actually did happen, because they, they, they ended up investigating Flynn, mm -hmm. was, well, it looks like the president's trying to use his presidential authority to do illegal things, to basically influence the director of the FBI not to prosecute somebody that may have broken the law and should mm -hmm. be prosecuted. And obviously the people on the left, that's how it was presented in the left-leaning news. Mm-hmm. Well, Comey was upset, so he was going to open his mouth and he saw it maybe like an insurance policy if he got fired by Trump. Yeah, he was like, Which don't you did. know who I am? I'm the director of the FBI. You can't fire me. I'm too important. He was very... I have a higher loyalty. I mean, I would be mad too if... How dare you? He went on a vacation and he couldn't come back. I mean, maybe that was part of it. I, I don't know. I love that. That's, <laughs> that's such a Trump move. Fire his ass when he's giving a lecture and he can't even fly back home. When I, he's going to find mm -hmm. his own way home. <laughs> That's so savage. Mm -hmm. And the memo was seen as a sign of potential interference by Trump with the investigation into whether members of his campaign team colluded with Russian officials. That was another trigger for it. So Rosenstein said, hey, Bob Euler, you're appointed. Let's start investigating. And what's funny is like a couple days before that or in that, that period of time as this is all going down, Bob Mueller had actually interviewed with Trump to be, I think it was director of the FBI. But Bob Mueller, was in, he was interviewing with Trump for one of the positions. I think it was to become director of the FBI again. But it's funny, Trump didn't select him. He ended up, uh, I can't even remember who he selected. So this is the interesting thing. FBI directors are typically appointed for a decade, and it's supposed to be kind of like a non-political thing because it's supposed to cause the president to not be able to interfere with what the FBI is doing. And so it's highly unusual for a president to fire the FBI director. But he had interviewed Bob Mueller for FBI director potentially. And it wasn't until Rod Rosenstein wrote the memo saying Comey should be fired that Trump had cause to actually fire Comey, which he did. But what's interesting is right after th this meeting had happened is like when all this went down and then Bob Mueller gets appointed as a special counsel to investigate Trump when he had just been interviewing for a job with Trump. Now he's going to investigate Trump. And every, most of the people he put on uh, his – Bob Mueller's investigatory committee, I, don't, I forget how many lawyers it was – but they were all they were all it all came out after the fact that they all were Democrats and all were Hillary supporters. And then that's when you get to the text with between the lovely Lisa Page and Peter Strzok and that whole episode. Cause they were I think they were originally were gonna be on the task for the special counsel task force. And when I guess when they're vetting everybody, those texts came to light because they were made on government phones. They got. They couldn't be on the special counsel's task force. Rosenstein made a statement, and he he made it clear. He put out the point why the Mueller investigation had to be done. Obviously, thinking that Trump was colliding with Russian, with Russia, 
And he states, I decided that appointing a special counsel was the best way to complete the investigation appropriately and promote and promote public confidence in its conclusions. He continues to say, as we know, the eventual conclusions were that Russians committed crimes seeking to influence election and Americans did not conspire with them. That's what he wrote. And why it was appointed special counsel. So I, that statement, you could say from a legal perspective, is like, well, if this, we spend all this money and all this time with a special counsel and he finds nothing, then it makes everybody look good. And, I mean, ultimately, as he said, the Russians committed crimes to influence the election, but no Americans conspired with them. In other words, there was no collusion, despite the fact that Peter Schiff and all these Democratic lawmakers and people in the, the news and... Uh, what's his name, John Brennan and Clapper, all, all those people that were former spooks and spies and supposed to be the people that are the smartest people in our government were all saying, oh, yeah, I've seen the evidence. There's definitely evidence of collusion. It definitely happened. And we spent, I don't know, $28 million or whatever it was in a special counsel. And or however, I don't know, maybe it's $100 million. I don't know, remember what the dollar figure was. We spent all that money and all that time. And Bob Mueller's like, I got nothing. I got nothing on him. I mean, I think there was a few people that got prosecuted because they lied or something like that, or there it was like process crimes or something like that, or paperwork. But it was nobody colluded. So I mean, that was Rob Rosenstein. He he appointed the special counsel, and he speaks on what the special counsel found, which was nothing. There was nothing there. It was all bullshit. And so you, when you listen to Peter Schiff or John Brennan or Clapper. And they talk about anything as an American because of this shit. Those guys have zero fucking credibility. I don't care what comes out of their mouth. Especially Brennan and Clapper. These guys are spies and spooks. Their job is to lie. So you have to assume that their lips are moving. They're lying. So nothing they say is credible. But if you want to laugh and be entertained, you can listen to them. But you can't – You know they're on CNN as like paid contributors or – you got to assume that whatever comes out of their mouth is probably bullshit. Once a liar, always a liar, yep. basically. <laughs> I'm going to say that the media um, outlets were covering what was going on, the drama, all the events that happened that led to the Mueller investigation and why what was said in each letter. CBS News reported it and other news outlets too. So the media had a fun day of reporting what was going on. It was a big story back then, for sure. Now, I have some information of what the FBI director commented in regards to Comey's actions. The acting FBI director at the time was Andrew McCabe. Andy McCabe. So the interesting thing about Andy McCabe is that Andy McCabe's wife was running for Senate, and Hillary Clinton's political PAC, political action committee, donated a bunch of money to Andy McCabe's wife for her election campaign. She ended up losing the election, she didn't get elected, but you go, here's the guy's de- deputy director of the FBI and his wife is running for office and Hillary Clinton had given his wife pol- her political campaign money. Hmm. So like that, that's another connection. You're like, man, that sure looks shady. I mean, if you were Andy McCabe and Hillary Clinton is – she's helping funnel money to your wife's election campaign – you can't help but be biased. That's a conflict of interest. And, and he, he should have recused himself, but he didn't. And Rosenstein said he was not fully candid, which means he fucking lied about what he did. And he wasn't forthcoming. So Andy McCabe knew he did something wrong. And Rosenstein caught him on it and called him on it. And so, again, Andy McCabe, he's a fucking liar. We know because the... The people that were, I think even Horowitz was like, the guy lied. He's a liar. So Andy McCabe, anytime he, and he's also in the news. I think he's on CNN now. So anything Andy McCabe says, I'm going to assume he's full of shit and he doesn't mean anything he said. So I'm not going to listen to anything that comes out of Andy McCabe's mouth. He's zero credibility. Again, trust the hardest thing to get and the easiest thing to lose. Mm -hmm. If you're on CNN, I'm going to assume you're lying. Yeah, you would track a, le- a paper trail of lying. 
So we get into who was assigned to the Mueller investigation. First, we have Andrew Weissman, who was one of the lead prosecutors on special counsel Robert Mueller's team. Wiseman was Mueller's aggressive lawyer. He was the one that would attack. Second person is Peter Strauss, deputy head, deputy head of counterintelligence at the FBI, who helped run the investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of private email server, and he was assigned to special counsel. Now, with Peter Strauss, there were that dude's a, a piece big of work. story between oh him and God. Lisa Page, former FBI lawyer. Uh, excuse me. The lovely Lisa Page. The lovely. Why do you call her the lovely Lisa Trump Page? Because Trump named her that, aptly so. He said, the lovely Lisa Page. <laughs> oh, is there something lovely about her, though? I don't know. Well, she's a leftist communist, but she's still a lovely woman. Mm-hmm. Come okay. So when rumors broke out, well, there was rumors and then it turned into a story where Peter Schrotz and Lisa Page were romantically, romantically involved. They were fucking and he's married. One, he's committing adultery. One, respect for your wife, first of all, but he Deputy didn't do that. Deputy head of counterintelligence at the FBI is banging one of his assistants out of wedlock. FBI lawyer. Page was also in the later, she was in the latest former Obama administration official enlisted by NBC, joining former CIA director John Brennan, Mueller deputy Andrew Wiseman, and Chuck Rosenberg, who was chief of staff to former FBI director James Comey. Damn, all the names are all together. Yeah, look at Back that. On. This is a good old boys club. Good old boys and girls club. Like, oh, so uh, Lisa Page was also married, too. I never heard that. I I never knew that, but apparently she was cheating on her husband. My thing, though, is if what they do you are both married. the lovely Lisa Page's husband thought when he found out that Peter Strzok was banging his wife? That explains the long nights. That's why you're not home. That's what I think. <laughs> but just Peter in general, if you saw any of the testimony when he went and testified to Congress, you were like, that guy is a weirdo. But it just goes to show you that even the nerdiest, goofiest, weird guy, he's in a position of power and he's banging this other married chick. Women are attracted to confidence and power. And even though Peter Strzok was a fruitcake and a Fruit Loop and a weird guy, like I said, you just look at his gestures and stuff. You can see some of the memes that were made mm -hmm. from when he's testifying. The guy, he looks... And he sounds like a weirdo. I don't know what's attractive about that. But it's power. Power. People do like that. She likes Girls that. like power. But also, it makes me think they seen each other often, if that makes sense, if they work together. So they must have built something or like gone out, gotten for Bottom a drink, lines, they were and fucking. then from there. They were fucking. Which created that. They were bumping uglies. Well, it was wrong in both ends to do that. Definitely wrong if, but who knows? Karma will bite them one day or has You cannot already. run karma. So I, I remember this uh, when this happened. It, it was all over the news. It was all over Twitter sphere and people were talking about it. One of the things that Andy McCabe, I guess he was speaking at some event or private event or whatever. And I, it, he obviously hated Trump and he made it known. He said, fuck Flynn, and then we fuck Trump. And so basically we get um, General Flynn out of the way. And he's no longer the, uh, what was it, Director of National Security? National Security Advisor. He was, he, Flynn was the uh, National Security Advisor Trump. He was a former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the highest position in the Defense Department as far as having all the secrets and all the spooks and all, all of those things. So, and he could have seen all this stuff because as he, he would have looked into all this stuff with these guys and they were all worried about him. They wanted to get Flynn out of the way because once they got Flynn out of the way, then Trump's rear end was his flank. In other words, he was, he didn't have Flynn to protect him anymore. And so they could go after Trump and just, you know, muck up and tie up his, his administration with investigations and 
as Chuck Schumer went on TV and said, hey, if you mess with the intelligence agencies, they've got 12 ways of Sunday to fuck you. And, and so you, the director of the FBI is talking like this. The FBI is supposed to just, hey, we're, wherever the facts lead is where the facts lead. The evidence is the evidence. And you got a guy who's deputy director go, publicly going, hey, yeah, we fucked Flynn and then we fucked Trump. Very inappropriate to say that. So you know he's working against the president. He doesn't give a shit that Trump got elected or not. He, That guy intends to do everything he can to fuck shit up for the president instead of doing his job. As we get into the story, you see yeah, more people against the president. Oh, so you have this text exchange that also came out, and this is why Lisa Page, lovely Lisa Page, and Peter Strzok were not on the special counsel's group is because these texts came out. They're text exchange that were on government phones because they're obviously brainiacs. And sleeping together. And sleeping together and talking on government phones. And so she texts Peter Strzok when Trump wins. She goes, Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right? He says, no. No, he won't. We'll stop it. You know, it's like these are people working the government thinking we're going to we're going to prevent a president who is legally elected, even though what was interesting about during that election in 2016, go, go, go back up, go back, stop, go back up one more. One and stay there. So what was interesting that was going on back at that time is you had a lot of people on the left going, it wasn't a legit, it was, the election was stolen. It, Putin helped Trump steal the election. And so that was you know, what you heard in a lot of left-leaning media and then you got these people working in the government going no we won't, he won't become president we're gonna stop it and, and then he later says oh it was just an off-the-cuff comment I'm like whatever when you look at all this shit that went down it looks shady you had people on the left leftist government marxist whatever you want to call it trying to prevent a duly elected president from taking office i mean any human being with two brain cells can read that and go, yeah, it seems like they're going like, to What's happening? What's going shit. on? What's the tea? What's going to happen next? These messages led to an investigation by the Justice Department's watchdog. So I, I believe it was Horowitz was appointed just because he kind of looks over the department and the employees and makes sure everybody's in, in the government is doing their job and so, so tell us what, what they found. They found missing, well, they recovered thousands of text messages. Because they had deleted them off their phones, mm -hmm. right? But there was a backup on the, since it was a government device, the, it's automatically backed up. When you, yes, when you delete something, it's always going to be recovered. It's like when you post something on social media, it's, later on, you're going to see it. Yeah. So you're never safe. It's never really deleted. Correct. And they should have been a little more smarter as adults. Say, hey, let's. if they were texting, they could have texted each other in their private phones instead of a, you know. That's why I said uh, they were brainiacs. FBI issued cell phones. Like, it's kind of common sense. You're going to get caught. If you're talking about things you're not supposed to talk about, it's an issue. And yeah, so the two were removed from Mueller's team when their texts came to light and both have since left the FBI. And Paige and Strauss were also involved in the probe of General Michael Flynn in Trump's choice for national security advisor. So they've seen each other other places when it came to that. Yeah, they were wasn't involved together. Stra Peter Strzok one of the people that went to interview Flynn and based on what happened at that interview, they, they were the ones that then prosecuted Flynn and said, he lied to the FBI. So Crazy, yeah. That's what happened. That's, that's shady, what went man. down. So, so that, that's basically what they did. Is because they have a conversation with Flynn. They're taking notes. They never said he was like under investigation or anything like that. Flynn's just like he just took over the job. He thinks, oh, some people from the FBI are coming over. I've worked with FBI guys before. Whatever I can do to help them, come on over. And Comey later said and bragged that he had sent Strzok and I can't remember who else was with him to talk to Flynn. So Flynn's just thinking he's having a friendly conversation with other people in the government, and they're all on the same team now. And what they do is they write down things and then they later talk to Flynn and Flynn says the opposite or says something slightly different than what he, he's just thinking he's having a off the cuff meeting with, with government colleagues. 
And they're basically trying to set his ass up. So they, as McCabe said, we can first we fuck Flynn and then we can fuck Trump. So we get Flynn out of the way and then we can, you know, go after Trump and he won't know which way our attack is coming from or who, who's doing it. And that's what happened. And Comey was the one. And you can see it publicly. He bragged about it. We were like, oh, why did these people go to see Trump? And Comey says, and I sent them there. He was very proud of it. And so it's like a, a just a setup. Big setup. Huge it's setup. It's not appropriate. Yeah, so you basically got government lawyers and investigators using lawfare to get rid of a president, somebody that they don't like. They're using the levers of power in the government that they were entrusted to, and they're abusing them. Instead of following the evidence, they're basically, you can see, they're, so they created a process crime in essence. And Flynn's like, he, he never, he didn't think, he's not under oath or anything. He, and so they ask him about it later, and he says something slightly different or a different recollection. And they go, oh, you lied to us. We got this down here. We came and interviewed you, and you said something different, so you lied to us. So you can't lie to the FBI. You should go to jail. So the things they tripped him up on were his communications with the Russian ambassador, Lav- Lavrov, or, or something like that. And it's just, it's like, come on, man. So, again, what these people do, and a lot of people get tripped up like that because they come after you, and the government's got unlimited financial resources, and they basically bankrupted Flynn. He had to mortgage his house. He, like, went through his his, his life savings, all money he'd made off his book, everything, because he's out of government at that time. And so the FBI is still coming after him after he's out of government, and he literally bankrupted the guy after his whole life and working for the military and dedicated his life to the country – and was one of the guys that eventually helped uh, ran the operations that tracked down uh, Zarqawi, who was the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq in the uh, early 2000s. It was leading the insurgency. He figured out where the guy was, and they dropped a, f- a couple 500, I think it was 500 pound or 2,000 pound bombs on where he was and blew his ass up. And the guy dedicates his whole life in the military to that, special forces guy, and you get these two fucking worms, and actually all these different little fucking wormy-ass people in government knifing them in the back. And it's, it's unconscionable. It, there's nothing honorable about that fucking behavior at all, all because, you know, you hate the fucking evil orange man that got elected. The orange man. <laughs> The orange Cheeto. Did Didn't he lot. tan so hard? I don't know what it was. Well, what, <laughs> there was stuff that I, 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 articles that I saw, a lot of those that he looked really orange. People had taken Photoshop and filters and made it extra orange mm-hmm. and put them out there as memes to kind of make, make fun of them and make it worse. Because you had the original photos and then you had a lot of the ones that circulated. And even the mainstream media was doing that and circulating. Mm-hmm. If you notice... When the media and like in a news article, if you look at the the thumbnail or the photo of the person, if they want to make the person look bad, they take a photo of them just looking horrible or ugly or a a weird – they're making a weird facial expression. If they want to make the person like what they used to do with Obama a lot is that you would see the presidential seal behind him, which is all blurry. And so it would make him look like he had a halo. He's always smiling. It was always the, the, the best pictures. Of him and the majority of the media, obviously, the ones in the right would pick pictures of him and his wife that just made him made him look bad. And but that's how you can tell the bias of the person writing the article is the picture, the image that's used is if it's trying to make the person look bad, they want you to think you're naturally going to think, oh, that's an ugly person, or they're not very attractive, or they're not very nice, or they look angry, or they look, you know, you see pictures and people like angry and pissed off. And so that, that caused you to form an opinion, oh, this person's angry. And then you read an article and you come away thinking a certain way because of that picture and because of the slant of the article. It's all emotional mm-hmm. manipulation. It's not newsroom. It's not like here's just the facts. It's the article is trying to get you to think a certain way. Picture a certain way too. Or I mean, the newscast. Newscast, yeah. So, Corey, after hearing the timeline, we can conclude the main purpose of the investigation was focused on Russia attempts to disrupt the 2016 election. 
possible coordination between associates of Trump and Russia, whether financial crimes were committed by any of the president's associates, plus triggering, triggering events leading to the appointment of special counsel. And we get into the Mueller report. A report was written after the investigation was um, well done, finished. Russia interfered in the election, but there was no evidence that Trump's campaign or Trump himself colluded with Russia. Mueller suggested that Trump obstructed his investigation and his report fell short of completely exonerating the president of any wrongdoing. So before wrapping it up, Mueller's investigation did result in indictments of 434 individuals, including some senior members of the Trump campaign, although none of the charges involved a conspiracy between the campaign and Russians. All of the in indicted persons are listed in this article in U.S. Today from March 2019. If you want to look at it really quickly to see who was indicted, and you can check that out. Well, go, go back to where you were. They died of 34 individuals. And then General William Barr declines to prosecute former. former FBI yeah, Director I remember that James when Comey. all that happened. I was, people were pretty pissed off because it looked like James Comey, Comey had done a lot of inappropriate things. Correct. But the I think it was Attorney Barr who had appointed Durham to be the the special, what do you call it, special counsel or special investigator? Special investigator. He was a special counsel because when all this, the Mueller investigation was finished, then the question is, where did all this shit start? Because all this Russia stuff was just garbage. It was nonsense. There was no collusion at all. So between, I mean, it's, Rod Rothstein said, Rosenstein said that there was no evidence that any American colluded. And so therefore... He, the investigation, the Russia whole, the whole thing should have never started. It's like, what are the origins? What, what were the, the dominoes or what were the, the snowballs eventually that turned into the big thing that became this whole investigation? Cause the argument, you know, Trump was making, his people were making is it should have never happened. And so Durham started, okay, so where, where, did, what set all this chain of events in emotion or, or in motion that led to this? And that's how all these dots eventually got connected in um, the Durham investigation, the Mueller investigation, people doing freedom of information and getting stuff out. Because the media, they weren't doing their job. They were selling a narrative, trying to make us think that Trump was an evil Russian Manchurian candidate and Hillary Clinton was wronged and didn't win the election because the Russians helped Trump win. And therefore it was Ill illegitimate in essence. And wronging a, or righting a wrong that was kind of the what was the the general theme that the media portrayed. When in, in reality, it was all these leftist weasels in the government and her political campaign. They were all working together to go after a political opponent because she she was worried because Trump was like, you know, you should be in jail. He told her at the debates that he was going to lock her up when he took president. So why wouldn't she believe him? Because Trump usually, when he says he's going to do something, he actually does it. And so and from her perspective, she probably feared that he literally would because, you know, she, she knows she'd done a lot of dirty, shady shit over the course of her life. And she probably on some level knows that she should be in jail for the things that she's done and gotten away with. And so why wouldn't she use everything in her arsenal to try to take Trump out? All of her connections, all of her friends, all of her influence, funneling money to deputy director of the... FBI's wife's political campaign through her connections, her political action committee. It's like, it's totally legal to do that. But, it, to, you know, any, any idiot can look at that and go, that, that doesn't sound legit. Hillary Clinton giving money to, to the, you know, one of the guys that's going after the president, his wife, it's, that looks like a payoff. How could it not be? Well, when you have power and money, at that point, they feel like they can do anything. They're capable of doing anything. But I can understand from Hillary's perspective and even Bill's perspective why this, this is the guy saying he's going to lock you up if he wins. And then once he has one, it's like, why wouldn't you do everything you could to fuck his shit up? Mm -hmm. You're literally fearing that you're going to be prosecuted and put in jail. 
And she was pissed that she lost. She did not like that. She felt she was entitled to it. I mean... It was her turn. <laughs> she believed that. No one likes to lose. That's one we can put out there. No one likes to lose. But I don't know about the entitled part. I wouldn't be entitled. If I lose, I lose. That's it. Move on. Re-elect again if you want. Well, I mean, remember, what was it? Uh, Time Magazine or one of them it had... Even before, right before that, because the media was like, Trump's going to lose in a landslide. And then he, he ekes out a victory, and he literally won by 82,000. It was 82,000 votes that in specific counties that enabled him to win the, the electoral college and or electors in the electoral college in such a way that he won the election, even though she won the popular vote. Because the whole idea behind the electoral college is that you have 50 states. So there's 50, we're not one country, we're literally a re- constitutional democratic republic of 50 individual countries. We, like in a, we're, we live in the country of Florida, and we even have our own constitution and our own, our, the, the governor is the president of our, the country of Florida in essence, but we're together in a, a union of countries. And so just because California ha- has the most population out of the whole 50 country union doesn't mean that they get to decide the majority of what happens in the country because the whole country is built on protecting the minority from the tyranny of the majority. So if you get the majority of the population in California or New York and you know maybe two or three states total, which is basically what you have, the majority of the population, if they were allowed just because of their population side to – dictate in essence the policy all the other 50 countries you got three countries basically telling the other 47 countries what they can and can't do and so the idea with the electoral college is to distribute the power equally amongst the states so you don't have one giant state that has a giant population and all the resources dominating all the rest and so that's why you have the electoral college Hmm. so it's meant to keep things even amongst the states so no one state gets too much power is able like one or two three states are able to band together and make the rest of the country live the way they want so anyways he won by eighty-two thousand votes so and therefore he wins the electoral college and the presidency yep the presidency because in essence 50 countries get to select the president. Mm-hmm. He won, I think, um, the states that were supposed to be for Hillary. He won those states, some of them. I yeah, the, the blue yeah. was a blue wall or there was some blue states it? that turned red. Wisconsin, turned red. Michigan, he, he won all those states. But for this presidency, the red ones turned blue when it came to Biden. So it was just like. Yep. And like then Zuckerberg that. spent $450 million or something like that in all those counties that he won and flipped <laughs> them back to blue. I mean, you can understand, like I, I, we talked about in a previous video, why Zuckerberg would do that. If a guy, if the president say, I'm going to destroy your business and break up Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and all that and cost you billions of dollars, financially, you'd be like, hey, $450 million to help flip mm-hmm. the election to get rid of the guy that's threatening to destroy my business. Why wouldn't I do that? It's like, yeah, I think enlightened self-interest, anybody in his position would probably do it. You say, is it a nice thing to do? Obviously not. Is it legal? Yeah, but should one guy have the power to to have that much influence? It's like, well, legally, he, hey, you know, he won that. He won that round with with Trump. You know, he kicked Trump's ass. Hmm. Well, moving on, the Mueller investigation ended without delivering the goods on Trump, as had been promised by many of Trump's opponents. The aftermath of, number one, the Mueller report not finding collusion, two, the findings of the DOJ Inspector General's report, and three, the report of a House Intelligence Committee investigation into Russian interference. That concluded there was no evidence of collusion. Many Republicans, including Donald Trump, claimed the whole Russian investigation was a political hit job on Trump and called to open an investigation of the investigators who were involved both in Crossfire Hurricane and in the Mueller investigation. Therefore, on to the Durham investigation. 
So a written report of the Mueller investigation was submitted to Attorney General Barr on March 22, 2019. In the Mueller report, Attorney General William Barr issued a four-page summary of the Mueller report. Wiseman felt Barr's statement sounded like the work of a political fixer rather than a public servant. So when we see all of this going on, there was another suspicions because it didn't sound right in the four-page summary. Of the but keep in mind, report. Weissman hated Trump. He's a lefty. At this point, it looks like everybody in this page hated Trump. So oh, yeah. we, 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 we go down the list. They're and we're all like, oh, cahoots. Well, I, mean, I don't know. They, like, just like Comey said, a higher loyalty. They felt like they, they were doing the right thing for the country. Mm-hmm. Even if it was shady and they mm-hmm. bent the law, broke the law in some cases, they felt it was their duty. Wiseman had a statement, quote, the four page letter bore no resemblance to our report in substance or in conclusions, conclusions, he says, and continues. I spent 20 years at the Department of Justice and seeing the attorney general behave in this way is something that is really soul crushing for many of us who are either at the department now or alumni of the department. Meanwhile, talk about no self-awareness, him and everybody else that was involved in the investigate, the bogus investigation because they found nothing mm-hmm. and wasted all that time and taxpayer money it's that's the guy he's he's projecting no one will ever say do or say anything to you that isn't a direct reflection of how they feel about themselves in a moment that's that's him admitting his guilt mm. and then wiseman argues that at key moments Mueller was timid when the when he should have been aggressive in getting information and testimony. And he says the report should have been far clearer in its conclusions about the pre- president's conduct. And it wasn't. So they didn't think it was clear and they thought they needed to open another investigation. So investigate the investigators. Mueller at the time was seen as like the gold standard of the dudes of the FBI. He was supposed to have impeccable character. And what was interesting is when you saw his testimony, obviously he aged and declined severely in the last few years. And so when he was given his testimony, he sounded really weak and really feeble and kind of out of it. And people were like, yeah, he's just kind of a figurehead. It, he didn't, it doesn't sound like he even really knew what the hell was going on in his own investigation he was supposedly running. Wiseman just threw Mueller under the bus, his own boss, which happens a lot often. In workplaces, people throwing each other under the bus. Have you ever been un- thrown under the bus, Corey? Many times in life. Sucks. Well, anyways, continuing on May 19, Attorney General Barr appointed John Durham, a DOJ veteran prosecutor and U.S. attorney for the U- for the District of Connecticut, to conduct a legal overview of the origins of Russian investigation. Because basically Barr and everybody looked at it and was like, man, all this stuff that went down with all these people was really shady. This investigation should have never happened. What, what, in other words, was, did people in the government abuse their offices and their powers because, for whatever reason, political reasons or, I mean, the Andy McCabe thing, his wife got money from Hillary Clinton's minions. To, to help her win an election, which she ended up losing anyways. But, I mean, it's it's legit. It's a legitimate campaign donation, but you could say, wow, it looks like a payoff. A big payoff, maybe. Four months later, Congress held a hearing on July 24, 2019, to hear the testimony of Robert Mueller to ask questions to determine if there was sufficient evidence to justify the impeachment of President Trump. Do you remember when that happened? A, a bit about what went down back then during that time, Corey? What, when the Durham investigation happened? No, when uh, Mueller was called into court to be asked questions. Oh, when he testified to Congress, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, that's what I was saying earlier was that he just looked really feeble and his voice sounded weak and he was hunched over. He looked exhausted and he, quite frankly, he didn't look like he wanted to be there. Do you remember, like, the headlines of, like, the newspapers at that time? Was it, like, 
well, standing the, now? Well, or? most of the newspapers, papers, what they seem to be kind of pissed off. They're, they really, because they, because what you heard the news for years is, oh yeah, the walls are closing on Trump. He's going down. And then Mueller's like, yes. So what he was saying was that Trump wasn't fully exonerated because of the stuff that Trump did after he elected. It looked like, he, in his opinion, it looked like he had done something wrong um, to kind of derail or obstruct justice. Obstruct justice. Well, as a youngster hearing this, this information and see what what went down is kind of sad. However, but pe- the people in the media overall were pissed. They were like, you know, and then they just start all started attacking and talking shit about Bob Mueller. Because again, they'd all been told for years, oh yeah, walls are closing. He's guilty. Clapper, mm-hmm. Brennan, and, you know, uh, Peter Schiff was on TV constantly, constantly. Oh, I've seen the evidence. Totally, there's evidence of it. It's definitely there. It definitely happened. <laughs> they were full of shit. Adam Schiff. Did I say Peter Schiff? Adam Schiff. Sorry. I didn't mean Peter. I meant Adam Schiff. Well, as a result, a majority of Congress voted on mostly partisan lines that there wasn't sufficient evidence of impeachable offenses to justify impeaching the president of the United States. So that happened. And then we go into the status of the Durham investigation which the investigation involved Durham in paneling a grand jury and having the power to issue subpoenas and compel testimony under oath. So far, the investigation has been very tight-lipped without any of the leaks that plagued the Mueller investigation. In other words, Durham is only speaking through the indictments and no one really knows how many people may end up indicted. So he's keeping it on the low. Doesn't want it to get leaked because obviously if you get it leaked, you get problems the in the down media. Down low. Back and full. I mean, when you do everything down low, Yeah, John come Durham, out uh, he's another guy that they all say has got impeccable credentials. He's a high character, high integrity dude. And he's just, just the facts. Wherever the facts lead is what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. And the people on the right obviously are arguing. Even when Trump was in office, they're like, when is this Durham guy going to finish? And here we are. We're a year into Biden's administration now. And this thing's been going on for years, and you got a, a handful mm-hmm. of people have been indicted and have pled guilty, but it's still ongoing. And we have no idea what's going on, which to me, that's a good sign because there's no leaks, unlike in the Mueller investigation. There was just constant shit coming out in the news, and, and uh, which all turned out to be totally bogus. Because you know these guys are all leaking yeah. to the press. It's I think a distraction, and it's it's not. That's a distraction. It's extra. It's too much extraness. You need to keep it on the low, do your job, and get it right. So obviously they want to do something different and make it right this time. Well, which, so far he seems to be doing it the right way. Yeah. But hell, I mean, by the t- what we were talking about the other day, it seems like by the time this stuff finally is done and he's finished with his pro, it could be a decade. Most likely. And. You imagine there are seven, eight years before this stuff all winds up and the prosecutions happen and people get convicted or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it'll have been 10, 12 years since all those events happen. Most people ain't going to give a shit because it's, it's so long since that happened, especially people who are younger. They're like, they didn't know anything because they weren't even, they were kids when Trump was president. They don't know anything. And now they're g- growing up. They're, they're adults now and, Oh, all these people got prosecuted. Like, who? Oh, yeah. Nobody's going to care because so much time has passed. Mm -hmm. The wheels of justice turn ever so slowly. Mm -hmm. I think it was also slow because of COVID, even though we shouldn't be talking about it. But that's what kind of made it down. But the first year, over the first year in this operation, it it took about $3.8 million dollars. So who knows at the end of the operation how much they spent? We just know in the Mueller one they spent thirty two million. So thirty two million was the total. Yeah, thirty two million. It's a lot of jack. A lot of money. On but time the government energy. just gave three hundred million more or three hundred billion, I think it was three or three hundred million to the Taliban for aid. Honestly, they need to give money to somewhere else. More things. 
hospitals. No, people case. are starving, and the Taliban are letting them starve because they're like, hey, we need money, we need food. Ah. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the Durham investigation covered pre- and post-election matter matters and reportedly has come to include the potential potentially improper unmasking of former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn and the basis for the intelligence community's assessment that Russia tried to help Donald Trump win the election in 2016. So they got to like, that was the other purpose for it. Bas but they still investigated the investigators from the, mis the Mueller investigation. That's what they were doing too. So it's a lot there. The result. In the first six months of Durham's investigation, there were no arrests. However, later on, two people were indicted. We first have Kevin Kleinsmith, former senior FBI lawyer, lawyer who was convicted of falsifying a document that was the basis for a FISA surveillance warrant against former Trump campaign official Carter Page. He pled guilty and was sentenced to one year probation. <laughs> What is Lied your thoughts to the on that? Lies a court and he gets a year of probation. You're lying it's to It's good authority. to be a gangster. It's not. I. It's not fair. But why would they choose to just do probation and not give him the good? Well, I would hope that maybe in return for his probation that. He spilled the beans on other people involved, and that will help in the prosecution of anybody else that was more deeply involved. Or if that's all that happens to him and and he de didn't give anybody else up, he'll be like, what? he got that's bullshit. So he's a snitch. Maybe. He might be a snitch or our government is incompetent and corrupt. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, Durham's supposed to be the gold standard of, of character and integrity in these kinds of matters. So, I mean, when you look at the, the laws and stuff that about lying and deceiving the FISA court, that's like, that's a big deal. You cannot lie to the FISA court. And this guy does, and it's like, ah, I get probation for a year, no big deal. It's all right. You get a mulligan. It's okay. So hope I mean typically when a guy like a client smith, the first dudes that plead guilty and get a in essence a slap in the wrist, it's because they've they've snitched on the bigger fish above them. Bigger fish. So because quite frankly, I want to see people I mean what these people did was evil. I mean that's you have people in government that basically committed sedition against a sitting president they literally tried to overthrow our government all these ass clowns with their shenanigans and so far you got a few people that got slaps on the wrist so but the investigation is ongoing i've seen people on the right going oh well this is just the the deep state or the government or the administrative state or the institutions protecting themselves and not much is really going to happen. It might go on for a few years, but not a lot will happen. We don't know. Still up in the air. Well, the second person we have on a bullet point is Michael Suzman, cybersecurity lawyer at Perkins Coy Law Firm, who worked for the Democrats and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, was indicted of charges of lying to the FBI in a 2016 meeting where he shared information about the Trump Organization and Russia. The case is still pending trial. He has pled not guilty, though. And then the latest indictment, which we heard the story last year, and this year they're going Dushenko. to do a trial. Yes, Igor Dushenko, a Russian analyst, analyst who analyst, a Russian analyst who worked on the Steele dossier that made unsustainable, um, um, unsubstantiated. Substantiated. I can't read. Unsubstantiated. A Russian analyst who worked on the Steele dossier that made unsubstantiated claims linking Donald Trump to the Kremlin. Denchenko was arrested in November 2021. Now, his trial date set will be in October. 
So in January of 2022, the first month of the year, the judge presided over the case of Igor, Igor Dachenko. And he approved a waiver allowing the defendant to be represented by lawyers from the same firm as attorney defending former Hillary Clinton campaign aides involved in a related inquiry. The good old boy network is still at it. The deep yeah. state protects its own. Well, we had to see what happens in October. You don't think anything bad would happen to him between that time, though, right? You shouldn't. What, like him taking a long walk off a short pier or something? I don't know. Him having a sudden heart attack? We don't know who else will be indicted, but according to conservative publication, The Federalist, 35 people were listed as people who could be in trouble. And these are... First, Gregory Brower was Jim Comey's FBI congressional liaison. 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 Brower played the game of claiming things were classified when they were not in order to label Republican investigators as leakers and hide how the FBI used the dossier. Two, we already spoke about Kevin Kleinsmith, but he was listed in this article. Next, we have Joseph Paintka, an FBI official. Was Pintinka a, or something like that. Pintinka, Paintinka. Is that like Italian? Probably different. I don't know. Right? Eastern European. Eastern European. He sounds like a fucking traitorous worm. Well, an FBI official was a go-between for Fusion GPS and the FBI. Tashina Guhar? The Department DOJ of Justice attorney. attorney. Deeply involved in applications to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance FISA court, which were used to spy on the Trump campaign using the dossier. Oh, so she was putting the bogus FISA warrants together? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. John Carlin, head of the Justice Department's National Security Division and got out of the DOJ in late 2016. He was a former chief of staff to Mueller. When Mueller led the FBI in the 2000s, Carlin was involved in the FBI's systemic abuse of the, F- of the FISA surveillance laws, which included spying on the Trump campaign. Everyone is spying. Spying, spying, spying. Well, the NSA spies on everybody. Yeah, but I don't want to be spying on. <laughs> you don't have a choice. That's that sucks. That's the uh, September 11th. That all that stuff is where the what was the Patriot Act. All that shit came from. <laughs> everybody said the time it's going to get abused, and here we are, fucking 20 years later. It's just totally being abused and turned against American citizens. Yeah, you got corrupt people in our government using it to go after. They're political enemies. They're people they don't like. Mm -hmm. David Laufman, a high-level DOJ official in the National Security Division. Laufman worked with FBI counterintelligence guy Strauss Strzok on both both the Clinton email investigation and the investigation into Trump campaign based on the still unproven Clinton paid and Russian source dossier. Mary McCord was the acting assistant attorney general for a time. McCord played a role in Yates' plan to spy on Flynn and then trap him with the Logan Act. Yeah, they were just really gunning for Flynn. Because, I mean, as the former director of the DIA and all of his background in the military, they knew he was the one guy that really could unravel all their bullshit. They had to get rid of him. They had to run him out. And they did. They won. Once Flynn, the, the biggest mistake that Trump made of his presidency was a lot was firing Flynn because once they got Flynn out of the way, Trump left his flank open and they just the enemy just came right inside his gates and defeated him. Damn. George Toscas, a senior official in the Justice Department, was in charge of the mid-year exam investigation into Clinton's email abuses. Toscas had a front seat to both McCabe and Comey's efforts to hide the fact that Clinton's emails were found on Weiner's computer. Weiner's Weiner's? Anthony um, Weiner. He was uh, Huma Abedin, who was Hillary Clinton's you know, right-hand assistant. Um, 
that was his his wife. So I, I guess there was because uh, Wiener's a weirdo. He's I think he's a he was uh, chatting with underage girls online and stuff and send you know bulging dick pics of himself back and forth. He was there originally in Congress. He resigned in disgrace and then he ran for like mayor, I think. Um, but he was constantly doing shit and Huma, his wife was backing up some of the, like, I think Hillary Clinton's emails and other communications on his computer cause they were, they were husband and wife. And so she's Hillary Clinton's right hand person. And so, you know, like I said, there, there was a backup of all of Hillary's emails on his, his actual computer. Mm-hmm. And before I was cut off, and former Obama Attorney General Loretta Lynch efforts. Before you were so rudely interrupted. To simply the Clinton email investigation. But it wasn't rude. You obviously had your, something to say. And When I was in uh, fifth grade, my teacher, who literally lived across the street from my grandmother, and my, my dad's mother, um, she was out sick one day, and, or a couple of days, and we had this substitute teacher, and all we did was like make like uh, rockets and airplanes that you make a tube out of like uh, what do they call it? construction paper, and so you could you could blow on it once it was made, and it would fly <laughs> across the room. And and so he didn't do any of the lessons plans, and she got really pissed about it. And I think he was never allowed to substitute it at school again because of that. But I remember he was an older guy, and you know. He'd be somebody would ask him a question. He'd be in the middle of answering it or something, and somebody else would chime in and interrupt him. And he'd go, "As I was saying before, I was, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted." <laughs> rudely interrupted. That was like nineteen eighty. God. Moving on to Almost the article. Years ago. So I, I mean, forty-two years ago. <laughs> Damn. I decided to go on the link so the viewers and yourself can see where the sources, where this is coming from, which is the Federalist. And we continue with Obama State Department people. So we move on to Obama State Department people. There's a list of a couple of people like Victoria Newland, Jonathan Weiner, Jonathan Finer, rhymes a little bit, Elizabeth Dibble. And Thomas Williams, Colin Kale, Kathleen Kavalek, and Louis Lukens. And the last three people that were mentioned were all State Department officials who had some sort of interaction with the dossier or Fusion GPS people. Moving on to the people who were tied to the DNC or Clinton's campaign. So if anyone is curious what each person did wrong and what were their positions, you can go back into the website, The Federalist. There's a link and it says key 35 people. You can check each one in detail, have a conversation with someone if you want to, et cetera. But I'm just going down the list. We have Mark Elias. 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 I've heard of him. What you heard of? Well, I just remember the name because he's one of those people because he's uh, tied to the Fuji GPS, he, um, the Clinton campaign, the uh, the lawyer, was it per- Perkins Coy? Yeah, he, he's a top Democrat election lawyer. So he, he's a big name. Then we have Robbie Mook. Did you write uh, Robbie Seuss or Michael Seussman? Yeah, I said Robbie. Another one, another attorney there. Yeah, Robbie Mook, yep. I remember him from the camp, her campaign. Jake Sullivan works for, uh, uh, what's his name? Sleepy Joe Biden. <laughs> <I think. laughs> National Security Advisor. So he's all wrapped up in this too. He, he helped put together the Trump-Russia collusion thing. Again, all bullshit because it's political opposition research. So now this guy works for Biden. Then we have Cody Shearer, Cindy Blumenthal. Oh, Cindy Blumenthal, I'll go back. Uh, oh yeah, I remember his him being in the news. I remember him being in the news. Oh, 
So tell us who Fusion GPS is. Now with the Fusion GPS people, we have. But tell us the company. Where are they? Why don't you read that to us? So Fusion GPS is a DC-based opposition research and public relations firm with the history of representing less than savory actors, including Planned Parenthood, the Venezuelan dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro, and Vladimir Putin's Russia. Fusion has been shown in court documents to have paid still unknown journalists likely for the placement of stories or to push a certain narrative. Yeah, so the, the way this works is you got people in the media, you got people in the media that they all hang out, they go to the same cocktail parties, they belong to the same country clubs, they all know each other, they all lean left, they're all friends, they're chummy with one another, they go to each other's kids' birthday parties and all that kind of bullshit. And so they just forward this, this hey, they're friends in the New York Times or wherever, they all hang out together socially, they're, there's people who are all there. Hey, I got this thing here, and they look into it, and then it comes out in the, uh, the the newspaper or the news, and then the FBI goes to the FISA court and goes, "Hey, well, this stuff, uh, everybody's talking about the news, so we really need to look into it." And and they're the ones that you could see the connection. All these people, it's just it's like a little club. They all know each other. Clubhouse. It's a good old boy network, as they that we call it. I'm not able to pr- um, pronounce this name, but I'm gonna try my best. Renat Akhmetshin, Akhmetshin, Russian spy. Yes, sir. And then Edward Baumgartner, a British national, but he was fluent in Russian. So I mean, at the end of the day, the important thing I was talking about earlier that there were Russians that were involved with steel and putting this thing together, and here's one of them, Russian spy. He was working with Fusion GPS, and these guys all know each other. They're the Russians are fucking with us. The Ru- it looked like the Ru- so from this the Russians are in cahoots with Hillary Clinton, and Hillary Clinton is a big fan of Saul Alinsky rules for radicals. So you accuse your opponent or your enemy of what you're actually doing, and so she's like Russia, 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 Trump's a Russia agent. Who's he working with? He's a Russian spy working with Fusion GPS, working for Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton's the ones actually working with the Russians to put this dossier together that ends up in the media, that ends up at the FBI, that John McCain's got, that's being passed around, and all this shit's being talked about Trump. Do you think your viewers would agree with you? Before? It doesn't matter whether they agree with me. That's the guy. Remember? He's a Russian spy. So we have known Russian spies Engage working with the company that's putting together this political opposition research for Hillary Clinton's political campaign. So all that her, you know, saying Trump's a Russian agent or whatever, she's got Russians literally working for her that her campaign is fucking paid for. That's the crazy thing. You understand propaganda. And if you watch the podcast that we did with um, Kwong, who he used to work in intelligence for the Air Force, and they taught him all, um, all how like Hugo Chavez and dictators and the communists. They they, they taught them political um, propaganda and how they manipulated and controlled their people. They literally studied it because he worked in intelligence. He had he had to have an understanding of this, and so he you know over the last several years, especially when Trump came into office, he started seeing all this stuff that our government is literally using this, and it's in the media. The stuff you see overseas is now here in our country. And so you have a, a known Russian, that guy is a Russian, Afri- he's a Russian spy, and he's working with the company that's put together the political opposition research. So there's your, that's right from the Kremlin to Hillary Clinton indirectly through those relationships and the people she's hired and is working with. So when she says Trump's the, you know, he's the evil Russian, um, Manchurian candidate. It's like that looks. That's her. That's what it says to me. Hmm. No comment on mine. Hmm. Next on we have Peter Fritsch, Mary Jacoby, Shalay Murray, or Murray, Niall King Jr., Thomas Katane, Katan, Daniel James, whoa, Daniel Jones, Glenn Simpson. I've heard of him. 
Oh, he's that's the head of Fusion GPS. That's why. Jones or Simpson? Oh, Simpson. So it looks like they're saying he lied to Congress. Uh, oh, Nellie Orr. I remember Nellie Orr is the wife of uh, a DOJ official, Bruce Orr. And, you know, you look into her, I think she's a pretty well-known leftist, communist, Marxist-type leaning politically. I mean, again, all these people that Hillary's involved with, it's what we've talked about in the past. When you really, when you look at our documentary we did on socialism and capitalism and you look at the history of Marxism, it's just basically the kids of the elite. The trust fund babies are the ones that come up with all this shit. Oh, communism or, or socialism or, you know, today's incarnation, Klaus Schwab and the WEF, where basically they think guys like them should be running and regulating every aspect of society. And it's sold to the public that hey, you're going to have this communism. We're all going to look out for each other. Everybody's going to have a place to live. You're going to have food and you can do the things you love and you want. And as long as you let us run everything. And a lot of people like the idea of a steady paycheck and they'll do what they're told. They don't want to, life is too hard. And so there's a lot of people that are susceptible to that. And so it's like when you look at all these people, that's their model of the world. That's their worldview. And so the way I look at it is communism, socialism, Marxism, it's fascism. They're all interchangeable. It's just basically another label for the elite to have almost, if not all the power. And then what happens is you end up with a, a mafia running your country, a criminal mafia that has all the monopoly on force and you can't do anything because they always cause everybody to disarm. Hugo Chavez, 2012, disarmed all Venezuelans. Hey, you don't need guns. They're dangerous. We collect all the guns. Only government has it. We'll have a much safer society. And now only criminals and the government have guns. And now the people can't resist because they don't have guns anymore. They gave them up. We're a civilized society. I mean, when you look at videos from the 80s, Chunky will tell you his, I mean, his dad, I mean, they all came from Venezuela and it was the nicest, most beautiful modern democracy in all of South America. And now it's just like a poor third world country because uh, under socialism, you get a mafia elite that now con concentrated power in themselves and they're running a tyrannical government. That's what happens. That's why communism, socialism, it never works. It's just another name, another set of uh, flowery ideas or utopic leftist ideas that this perfect group of people will make the perfect society. Hmm. And you just end up with a mafia elite. So it's another scam by the elite to concentrate all power in themselves. Hmm. Moving on, I, the big fish... There's a part in the Federalist article, Jim Clapper, Comey, Andrew McCabe. John Brennan. And John Brennan, yes. Yeah, so John Brennan's former director of the CIA, James Clapper's the former, I think it's director of national intelligence, and the, I mean the two top spies in civilian um, agencies and who are paid and known lot that's what they they did for the government is they were the head liar i mean that's the cia days are sp the cia spies that's what you're supposed to do the cia and um and then jim you got jim comey head of the fbi annie mccabe but i mean these guys all go on cnn the other comey hasn't been seen in a while though which is he's been very quiet but in their mind they're the story they created to justify everything was that like Comey said, a higher loyalty. I have a higher loyalty to whatever. I mean, you can read his book. It got great reviews, but he believed he was doing the right thing. And so everybody can look at the evidence, go, is he a legit good guy? Was his higher loyalty well-placed and honorably done? Or was he just another dirtbag leftist communist that was trying to help his person win because he felt his person should be in? Here's another interesting tidbit about James Comey, Mr. Higher Loyalty, and John Brennan. Both of them were admitted communists when they, I guess, when they were in college. And so when you look at their behavior, he's a, they're, they're probably still communists. They believe that the government, the super state, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, the administrative state, should be making all decisions because they, as Comey says, have a higher loyalty. But they were 
you know, once a communist, probably always a communist. So you, if you look at the people he associates with, they all lean left. They're they're connected to or Hillary's campaign connected to the 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 Russians, the known Russian spies. It's like it's like come on. Our government is incompetent and corrupt. Final question. Corey, what are your thoughts on this whole situation about the state of our politics? Communists are inside the wire. Bottom line, they're in every government agency. They're in our education system. They're Marxists, socialists, communists. At the end of the day, they believe that people like them should be running and regulating the, every aspect of our lives. They want to concentrate more power in the government. And they will lie, cheat, and steal and do all. They don't care. They believe, like Comey says, they got a higher loyalty. He believes he's doing what's righteous. And that's every tyrant that's ever existed, every Adolf Hitler or Mao or anybody that's just killed lots of people. They all believed they were being benevolent and they were doing the right thing for the greater good. And as Lord Acton said, liberty exists in the distribution of power, tyranny in the concentration of it. Lord Acton was a member of British Parliament and obviously was all about the freedom and the liberty of the individual. And when you concentrate power in anything, whether it's the teachers' unions or the police or the military or the government or the IRS or the CIA or the DIA, any the forest agency, the Department of Education, anytime you concentrate power, you get fucking dirt bags that are corrupt, rising to the top, and they get too much power. And when they have too much power, you get the worst kind of people that will lie, cheat, steal, and do anything. And you can see from this, these people are fucking ruthless. There's ruthless what they did. To me, I look at that and I go, that's sedition. These people should be prosecuted such because they tried to overthrow. And you could argue successfully overthrow a duly elected president. And we're literally bureaucrats in government. were going against the will of the people because the people, whether you like him or not, whether you agree or not, Donald Trump won. He was the president. And therefore, he had every right to run the country the way he saw fit. And these fucking people committed sedition. They committed high treason, in my opinion, based on what I see. This is unconscionable that this shit happens. It's, I mean, half of them are a bunch of ass cons. You just listen to these people. It's like, you wouldn't trust these people with your children. You wouldn't. I wouldn't trust any of these cocksuckers to lead me across the street. I mean, they're a bunch of lying dirtbags. I mean, the, many of them have already been convicted and admitted they're fucking liars. And so I don't trust anything they say. These are not the kind of people you want in government. They have no honor. They believe they're doing the right thing, but they're snakes. There's, um, there's a quote. Um, I got to find this quote and read it. So I'm going to read this. So this all brings to mind a quote by Cicero from 42 B.C., and it says, a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly, but the traitor moves among those within the gate freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a city he infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. Mic drop. <laughs>